Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Well, the NDA lifted on Quake Champions and the open beta has been running for the past few days, which has given me the opportunity to try a game that I've been quite interested in ever since it was announced. However, its announcement did not exactly come along with rapturous applause from all of those looking at it. Indeed, the game has received a lot of criticism from various corners of the internet, forums, subreddits, message boards, and so on and so forth, that have made some interesting claims about it. And many of those have consisted of something of a purist attitude, claiming this is not the quake that they wanted, that they want a pure arena shooter, that they want to go back to the good old days. Here's the thing about that argument. I don't believe that it's supported in reality. I don't believe there is, in fact, anything that proves that these people exist or in large enough number to actually support a product. And the basis of that argument comes from the fact that there have been games that have attempted to do the pure arena shooter experience and have done so even quite recently. Now, guess how many of those games have done well? Yeah, the answer would be none of them. None of them have done well whatsoever. I'm talking about games like Toxic. I'm talking about games like Xenotic. I'm talking about games like Warsaw. I'm talking about games like Reflex Arena. That's a mix of premium games and free games. Some that have free-to-play modes. Those are four different arena shooters that are, for the most part, pure arena shooters. No crazy gimmicks or anything along those lines. They are similar to Quake. They are similar to Unreal Tournament. And none of those games have a solid player base. Now, my argument is this. If there really is a massive, latent audience of pure arena shooter fans that are just itching and waiting for the right opportunity and the right game to come along to bring them all back into the fold, to create a huge, glorious scene, the revival of arena shooters in 2017, if that audience actually exists, then I want to know what game is required to actually bring them out of the woodwork, because apparently it was none of those. Which makes me wonder, well, what are your requirements? Now, here's what I think. I believe that if arena shooters were truly what I like to call the desperation genre, a genre in which there is a massive audience that is not being served, that are desperate to get their fix, then that audience would have gravitated towards any game that even remotely resembled Quake 3 Arena. They would have gravitated towards Toxic, Warsaw, Xenotic, etc, etc. Reflex Arena being, again, another very recent release that is not doing well at all in terms of its concurrent player numbers. It would hardly be the first time that a game's tried it, and you can make the argument, well, those games just, they do something wrong. Okay, well, what is the perfect arena shooter? Because it sounds to me like the perfect arena shooter is Quake 3 Arena or Quake Live, and those games, spoiler, already exist. Quake Live's player base is dipping. It is continuing to dip. It's been dipping for years. It still exists, no doubt, but the transition over to Steam and some of the changes they made had a very brief revival of the player base and pretty much died off. A lot of people said, oh, well, the reason it died off is because they made those changes, like loadouts and such. Well, as it turns out, the vast majority of servers for Quake Live don't even run that right now. So no, that is not the reason at all. So my belief is quite simply this. These purists, as they were, like to brag. They like to complain, and they like to wistfully wish for experiences they had 10 to 15 years ago. Experiences which were most likely not in any way representative of the actual competitive nature of those games. They're talking about the experiences they had at LAN parties 10 or 15 years ago. Playing with their friends, drunk off their ass, playing random game modes, playing mods. They weren't involved in the competitive scene for Quake or Unreal Tournament. In fact, quite a few competitive players so far have stated that they are actually really enjoying aspects of Quake Champions. These are the guys that actually won money, that actually played in the competitive scene. As far as I'm concerned, these so-called purists are nothing but wannabes and showboaters. They're pretending. And maybe they find it fun. But I don't think that that should influence the development style of any game. And I don't think that it should be taken into account. Because if those numbers were big enough, they'd have already gravitated towards existing experiences that pretty much fill that niche. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about what Quake Champions actually does. And let's talk about things like the business model, the game modes available, some of the problems the beta currently has that are perhaps a little bit 
deeper than simple bugs. Because, of course, betas are going to have bugs. This one is no exception. The lightning gun, for instance. If you're out of range of the target, the gun itself will not actually show the animation of firing, and yet it will drain ammo anyway, which makes it quite difficult to target with. It's a bit of a pain. There are a couple of problems with it. But it's a beta, and one would expect that that will be resolved. What Quake Champions is, is Quake. It even has very similar maps to Quake 3 Arena. Maps that were lifted from that experience, from Quake Live. But this time around, they have so-called champions. And these are classes, for the most part. You can see here the number that are currently available. We currently have nine of them. And these classes differ in many ways. This is your basic ranger. It's the guy from Quake 1. You should recognize him. Now, you might notice these three stats right here. Base health and max health. Base armor, max armor. And speed. That's in units. Now... These are worth bearing in mind because different champions have different starting and maximum health and armor amounts. You see, this guy pretty much jack of all trades. Pretty quick. Not the quickest, but quick. Starts with 100 health and 25 armor. Can max out at 75 unless you are picking up the mega armor. Which, of course, can go past that limit and will eventually drain back down. Same with the health, by the way. This guy, on the other hand, starts 25. His max is 75, but he has a lot of HP. He has a larger hitbox, however, and slower speed, but this is where things get interesting, because starting stats, sure, they affect the game, no doubt about it, especially when dealing with very hardcore classes like Anarchy, who starts at 75-25, which makes him pretty squish, or Slash, who starts with no armor whatsoever and only has a maximum of 25 armor, so not great, right? But here's where things get interesting, the passive and active abilities. Every character has an active ability, which is on a long cooldown, which can be reduced by picking up these little hourglasses on the level. So there are power-ups to decrease the cooldown of your ability. In this case, the plasma trail means that she's going to jet herself forward, leave a plasma trail on the ground, and then another click will ignite it, doing a lot of damage. Ranger has the dire orb, which is basically a teleporter. Throw the orb forward. Hit the button again to teleport. If you happen to teleport into somebody, you do massive damage. Telefrag, essentially. Scalebearer has Bull Rush, which allows him to charge forward. And if you're able to hit somebody, which is tricky because your maneuverability goes down the toilet, then you're going to do some damage. You also are more resistant to damage when bull rushing. So that kind of thing. It's a big difference between abilities, but... Passives are where things, in my opinion, get very interesting because passives are usually related to the movement style of the character. And there's a significant difference in the way that each character actually handles. Now, in the case of the Ranger, he plays like you would expect a regular character from Quake 3 Arena to play. You want to be strafe jumping, that will increase your speed past that base amount here. It's a good way to do things. And in his case, he has a passive which reduces self damage. So, you're going to be emphasizing rocket jumping with this guy more than any other class. If you look at Scalebearer, bear in mind he has 300 base speed. If he gets to 400 units, his momentum will cause him to damage enemies that he collides with. So yes, you can get faster. There have been rumors that things like strafe jumping and the movement mechanics from Quake were removed from this game. That is absolute bullshit. Not only are they here, but there are several characters that very much rely on them. Here's a great example of that. Anarchy, Hoverboard Pro, allows him to make sharp turns at high speed in the air. So, with a character like this, whose base speed is already pretty fast, if you get up a lot of speed by strafe jumping and get airborne, you will have superior control to anybody else. Another great example would be Slash, who has the ability to do a crouch slide. So you're going to be strafe jumping, but you're also going to be crouching on landing, which is going to allow you to slide and build up yet more momentum and speed. The one that was most interesting to me is Visor, who has no movement speed cap at all. Now, yes, these other classes do have a cap, and you might be saying, well, that's not Quake Live. Well, this character doesn't. So if you are the kind of person who can get up to ludicrous speed by strafe jumping, this is the character to play. And from what I've heard, speaking to some of the competitive players that have tried this, Visor is a very popular character for that very reason. And in fact, the fast characters are heavily favored over the slow ones, especially considering they often have smaller hitboxes that are harder to hit, and higher speed allows you greater control over the map and its pickups, which is the key component of competitive Quake. And by that I mean 
Dueling Quake, not Team Deathmatch or anything like that. We're talking about one versus one, the classic competitive Quake duel that basically consists of the Quake esports scene for the last 10 years and continues to some degree to be that way to this day. So yeah, there are definitely differences in what these guys can do, but otherwise they're going to be using exactly the same weapons. There are no special weapons or anything along those lines. I think some of these abilities are certainly going to need balance, no doubt about that. There are some very powerful ones, and there's a couple that I don't really like because they're not very interactive, I guess. Now, Barry is a great example with Clutch. Very strong tanky class. He puts up a barrier, it deflects weapons fire for a short time, deactivating your ability to shoot. There's not really a lot that you can do about that as somebody that's attacking Clutch. Like, basically you just have to stop shooting at him till he brings his shield down. I don't think it's a very interesting interaction between two players. I think that something that stops you fighting a player is not an ability that you would really want in a game about fighting other players. Not really keen on that. He's got some interesting passives. He's got two of them, in fact. His, run, his movement system, he's one of the slowest in the game, but running forward without changing direction causes clutch's speed to increase. So he's a very kind of newbie-friendly character. Someone that's going to increase speed without really having to strafe jump. So you have that option. But honestly not someone who's probably going to be favored in competitive play. And that's fine. It's okay to have characters like that. And that's the advantage of having a class-based system here. You're all fighting on the same level playing field in terms of pickups and weapons. Those are things you have to get on the map. But you can play in different ways. You can customize based on your preference. You can learn different systems and you can... Settle upon a character that suits your playstyle without completely and totally changing the way in which Quake operates. This is not Team Fortress. You know, it's not Overwatch either. You're not going to be sitting behind a character holding down a heal beam. No, you're going to be fighting just like everybody else. You're just going to have a couple of different ways to do it. And that, I think, is a very good thing. And, of course, it means that the game has potential development longevity with the addition of new champions. Now, here's what you're going to ask me. And there's a lot of inf information about this online, but some of it is out of date. What's the business model? Is this a free-to-play game? Am I going to have to buy champions? Okay, so there's two ways of doing it. Either you can play it free-to-play, which allows you to rent champions for so-called favor, which you earn in-game. You rent them for a day, and I know some people are going to turn their nose up at that. I don't really blame them, because it is an annoying system, but it's okay for trialing characters. I don't mind it for that. Or you're going to buy them outright with Platinum. And that is real-world money. I don't know of any way to unlock characters permanently with in-game currency at the moment. If there's a plan to do that, it's not in the beta. As it stands, the beta, unsurprisingly, has all champions currently unlocked. That was a fairly recent change. It only had Ranger available by default, and then they gave you some favor to try some stuff out. But here's the other thing. You can play it free-to-play, or you can just buy it like a regular game at $50, and... Extremely important, you get all champions now and in the future. So, you can completely avoid that free-to-play nonsense. Until I heard that, I was not keen on the champion unlock idea. In particular, there is a game mode called Duel, which requires you to be able to draft three champions against an opponent's draft. Not having access to all the champions would give you an objective disadvantage in this mode. Because you wouldn't necessarily be able to come up with a counterpick. From what I can tell, the... Classes are never hard counters to each other, but there's definitely a counter-picking element to it. So if you don't have access to all of them, and hell, you do, maybe you don't even have three, you can't even play the mode. I was concerned about this until I learned you can just buy the box. At that point, I view free-to-play as a form of either demo or pay-as-you-go business model. Instead of throwing 50 bucks down, I can throw down nothing, and if I like it and find a character I like, I can throw down five for the character. That seems reasonable to me. If I'm a very casual player that doesn't want to drop $50, but I just want to play Scalebearer and Ranger, I may be, you know, this is now a $5 game for me. And yeah, I can get these characters later on if I want them. Pay as you go is good. That's consumer choice in action. If you don't have that option, then no, it's not as good. No doubt about that. But I think the free to play accompanied by buy once, get everything is good. It's a good model, and they also need to be very careful about communicating that fact, because a lot of people, myself included, didn't know that that was the case. And they're going to bounce off it, perhaps as a result of this whole champion unlock thing. Alright. Now, let's look at customization. Another part of the business model is, unsurprisingly, loot box-based cosmetics. Overwatch has definitely made that the popular thing to do. 
I personally don't have a problem with it. I just prefer being able to unlock the things that I want rather than being at the mercy of randomness. You are given loot boxes on a regular basis for play, and you can also buy them. As for the cost, we don't know yet. The beta does not have money purchases available. You can go to the store, and you can see whatever, you know, space box this is, but that's really about it. There's a couple of different kinds of them available. These are only unlocked for in-game currency, then chests and reliquies. So, you know, bigger with rarer items. All of them are cosmetic. I do not know if they're going to do champion unlocks that way as well. That would be a nice little addition to get a bonus champion out of that. If you're a free-to-play player, I think it'll be a good thing to add. But outside of that, you're going to be looking at your set right here. That doesn't really change your silhouette. I think they've done so far anyway in the beta a pretty good job of giving you different skins, but also giving you a good amount of customization for them. Because you can also attach accessories to that skin, as you can see, and you can customize on an individual piece level. So you don't have to pick the set. I can just go headpiece here. I can just pick a set of legs, put an attachment on it if I like, or not, and also then apply different shaders, of which there are a huge number. So this is closer to the new Dooms multiplayer customization than anything else. And there was some pretty crazy stuff they could do with it, up to and including classic weapon skins that have been redone. I love this in particular. I desire these items. This skull shotgun. This Quake 4 lightning gun. This Quake 1 rocket launcher. Yes, I definitely desire those things. That's a great idea for cosmetics. And of course, you can throw in other id software games in there as well. Maybe even since they're partnered with Bethesda, they can take weapons from shooters that are not id software. Maybe take some from Wolfenstein and New Order, for instance. There's a lot of possibilities and options here for cosmetic monetization going forward that isn't unfair and isn't unbalanced. There is a crafting system, so I assume it's got the same thing that Overwatch does, where if you get duplicates, you get shards. But the same complaint that comes along with Overwatch is probably valid here as well, that the amount of shards you get are most likely going to be incredibly stingy. So if you get, say, a dupe legendary, you're going to be left with a pitiful pile of shards, and you're going to be thinking, well, I got screwed there. And I wouldn't disagree with you whatsoever on that. So that's basically the business model. With, along with my opinion on so-called purists at this point. So the question, I suppose, at this point would be, how does it play? Well, it runs very well, I'll say that. The beta runs great, very high frame rate, no doubt about that. I'm going to play you some matches, I think. I'll show you the different game modes. Team Deathmatch, Duel, and Sacrifice are the things you want to be paying attention to. TDM is exactly what you think it is. Deathmatch is up to eight players. Couple of maps available in the beta. Duel is this interesting one versus one drafted mode. I'm going to show you how that works. And Sacrifice, which is a new four versus four team based mode, which is a little bit of a different spin on Capture the Flag. I actually enjoy that mode quite a lot. I've played it, but it seems to confuse a lot of the puppies. They don't play it very well because perhaps it's a slight modification of Capture the Flag. Some people get a bit confused. That's probably down to certain UI elements within the mode itself, but outside of that, it's probably people not paying attention. They should be in TDM instead. Okay, let's play some Quake Champions, shall we? And I'll talk a little bit about what's going on and how it feels. Prepare for draft. Let's start with dual mode, because it's perhaps the most interesting. What you've got here is a draft. So I'm going to choose a character, then the opponent is going to choose two, and then I'm going to pick the rest. So there is a counter pick element to this. So, this is the way that the game actually works. When you lose a character, you will spawn as the next one. When you lose all three, you lose the round. Alright, so I'm going to there we go, grab Slash. There we go. So, that's those are my three. So, it is a best of three in rounds, but it's basically a best of five inside the round itself. So, as soon as you've killed off the opponent's roster of characters, the whole game resets puts one point on the board for you, and then you go again, and you start again from the beginning of your draft. It's a pretty interesting approach to it, <clears throat> because Duel, of course, has been the de facto competitive esports mode for Quake for a very long time. Simple one versus one. Now, in this case, what they've done is they have kept that one versus one experience, but they have incorporated the champions. And in this case... What that allows people to do is, of course, counterpick certain champions. And it also, to some extent, helps with the balancing issues that would be inherent in a one versus one duel game where you pick classes. If there is one that is fundamentally more powerful than the others, well, he can pick it, you could pick it, maybe 
and they haven't put this in the game yet, but maybe you could ban it. And of course, you can potentially counterpick it. And as long as you've killed off that guy, he won't be able to use it for the rest of the round. So if there is a balance issue, it does somewhat mitigate that. Hello. Now, outside of that though, you're dueling. The same way as you would in any other Quake game, you try and kill him. And a lot of this also has to do with the control of the map and the various pickups. I managed to grab the armor here before he did. There is the mega health that I need to consider. Competitive one versus one Quake is maybe less about aiming and more about resource management and map control. If you have access to the red armor, which in this case is the green armor, but hey, and mega health, and the other guy doesn't, and you're about the same skill level, you should win the fight. In theory. You have equivalent skill. You know, there's only so much that you can really do when it comes to aim. Now, there's... If, even if your aim is perfect, weapons do a preset amount of damage. There's only so much you can really do there. You can't optimize any further beyond that. And of course, movement has an awful lot to do with it as well, obviously. Choosing when your engagement happens. But a lot of that is simple numbers. Having control of these items. I currently don't have the rocket launcher. I could really use that. He has the railgun and I don't. I should probably grab that. That gives him an advantage in certain parts of this arena that I don't have. Assuming that he's good with the rail. And of course, in a competitive mode, you'd assume the guy's good with the rail, right? We're talking about very much a competitive mode. He's probably hiding around here. If he had any sense, he'd have been camping with the rail. So that when I went to go and get the green armor, he'd have just sniped me with it. Hasn't done that yet, though. There's also that additional element of resource management here with those little yellow hourglasses. Because if your ability's on cooldown, you won't be able to use it. And abilities are fairly powerful. But there is a lot of counterplay available to those abilities. If I use my Dire Orb, I can miss. He can move out of the way. And more to the point, he knows when I'm going to teleport to that location. So he could even take advantage of that. He could place a rocket there. So as soon as I spawn, I eat it. That would certainly suck for me, no doubt. And there are various other abilities as well that just have straight up counterplay. Not every one of them does other than run away, which I think is unfortunate. And maybe they need to do another pass on those abilities. I think any, any non-interactive ability is something that they should probably be looking into changing and making more interesting. I also need to learn a bloody aim. I'm going to go and try and get some more armor. Oh, he is apparently not pleased. All right. Put down some... Oh, God. The armor hasn't spawned. I'm in trouble. Get the LG out. See if I can finish him off, maybe? He's lagging a little bit, which is certainly not helpful. Switch to the shotgun. Oh, great. Now he's uh, lagging all over the place, which makes him very hard to kill. Ah, <sighs> that sucks. <laughs> I lost you to lag there, more so than anything else, although I certainly should have killed him faster than I did, I'll admit that. But regardless, that sucked. Netcode is something that this game needs to make sure is absolutely bloody perfect. Guess what? It isn't. I've seen problems, no doubt. Players who have warped, and players who seem to be able to switch that on and off at will. He may very well be hacking. He may very well be lag switching. I, I certainly have a lot of difficulty hitting him now as a result of that. But hey, it's good that we got to show that because it is a major concern and it's been brought up by those that have played the beta up to this point as well. They've just said, look, I have encountered netcode based issues and hitbox based issues as well. I talked to a couple of pros about this and they explained that the way hitboxes work in this game is actually too accurate for a fast moving arena based shooter and it affects the balance of the weapons. The way the hitboxes work is they're very precise to the specific shape and animations of the character rather than being kind of boxy. That means that, depending on the character, there are certain weapons that will do less damage. The shotgun in particular, apparently, is very much affected by this. And this is something of a big problem. Something that competitive players have already mentioned, and certainly do not like. They would prefer boxier, more arcade-like hitboxes that would be more appropriate, ow, for use in an arena shooter. You don't want Rainbow Six or Counter-Strike sort of level of accuracy. That's not the kind of game this is. Ugh. So they could do with fixing that, and obviously, netcode is a problem. And they've got to resolve that too. Well, timer ran out there. That sucked. Prepare to fight. But I go on to the second round, everything kind of resets. 
you'll notice that you get to choose from three starting weapons. Now, you might be thinking, oh, is this like the loadout system in Quake Live or in Doom? It's not. Here's what they did. They gave you a choice of three weapons, but they're basic versions of the weapon. The pickup version is stronger. So if I start with a shotgun, I only start with a single barrel, not a double barrel shotgun, like this one. And this one is more powerful, obviously. The machine gun has a super machine gun, there's a super nail gun as well. This is a nice choice, in my opinion, because it lets you start with a weapon that is more suited to your playstyle, something you're a bit more comfortable with, instead of forcing you to start with a crappy machine gun, but then lets you upgrade that, so it means that that pickup had value that it previously wouldn't have in other Quake games. That's a pretty cool idea, in my opinion. So at least every pickup is something you're going to want, something that is desirable, as opposed to in Quake Live with that loadout, where it's like, well, oh, they have the rocket launcher. It also means that it addresses the concern that a lot of people had with that system, where it's like, well, it just devalues pickups too much. I, I don't want that. I want to start weak and become stronger. Well, you certainly still do that here. And obviously the acquisition of armor and mega health is a huge part of that. He's around here somewhere. There he is. But, at least you don't start with nothing. And there goes his lag again. Magically, when he's losing a fight, he suddenly starts to lag. Funny that, isn't it? Well, congratulations. You're on video. This mode feels pretty good, but according to some competitive players, they do have some issues with it. Spawns are a problem. If you end up, you could end up spawning right next to the enemy player immediately after death, which could actually be a bad thing or a good thing. After a big fight, the enemy player hasn't had the time to go and collect resources again. And since you start with a decent enough weapon, you could maybe blow him away. Alternatively, it could end up the other way around. He won the fight well, you spawn next to him, and oh god, he has a rocket launcher and a bunch of armor. I have just a basic machine gun. I'm dead again. You know, it can, it's a big momentum sway. It's a random element that needs sorting out. Perhaps a good way to do that would be ensure that those spawn distances are quite specific and that you can't end up spawning too close to an enemy. Maybe you've got to spawn across the map. That is possible. Apparently, it also emphasizes faster characters because the most important thing when respawning is the ability to collect resources and health and armor again. And, of course, get your weapons back because the other guy has all the weapons and you don't after losing a fight. There's also the point that if you've worn an enemy down and they are playing a fast character, they can very quickly go and reach the armor or the mega health and then they are right back where they started and all the damage you did to them in the previous fight is now completely irrelevant. Yeah, that can also be an issue. So those are the kind of things they're going to have to look at from a purely competitive level. Although, honestly, looking at Sacrifice in particular, it almost makes me wonder if they're going to try and move away... I just can't hit this guy. If they're going to try and move away from the dual is esports kind of approach. They may decide not to use that this time. They may decide that 4 versus 4 Sacrifice, again, that capture the flag-like mode, is their chosen esports mode. In which case, that will not be a problem. But, of course, a lot of people want to play dual. And what's going to be on the mind of some people at this point is probably quite simply, I just want to play Quake. I don't want any of this fancy nonsense in my Quake. I want my pure Quake experience. Okay, well, I think that this game can provide that. I think you can just turn off all of the stats. You can make everybody start with 100 health and no armor. You can turn off the class abilities and you can just go. You probably have to adjust the size of the hitboxes a little bit to make them more balanced. Although Quake 3 Arena did have some weird shaped characters and didn't seem to bother most people. And you could just go with that. I think offering that pure mode is a great answer to people that are complaining. Saying, oh, well, I want the pure Quake experience. Right, well, just offer it then. It's a free-to-play game that you can optionally buy all the stuff for at $50. I don't think there's any harm in having a pure mode. And in fact, this brings me on to a point of something that is clearly missing right now that would help a lot, and that is actual custom dedicated servers. Now, according to the game itself, these servers that we're running on right now, they're dedicated. Obviously, it hasn't stopped quite a bit of the lag, as you've noticed, and the issues that we had there, but supposedly this is a dedicated server we're running on here. So that indicates to me that there wouldn't be any problem at all whatsoever with somebody running their own server and then allowing them to customize it and put their own rule set on. And magically, magically, you go lagging again as you're on low HP, you cheating bastard. Man, if we beat him despite that, that would be pretty great, but I... I oh. 
Well then, congratulations on your ill-gotten win. Anyway, at least that's a demonstration of what uh, dual mode is. It's a fun mode, honestly. As long as they put a good matchmaking system and have ranks and leagues and all that kind of thing, yeah, I think people will enjoy it a lot. But obviously it's going to be a problem for free-to-play players because they don't have access to all of those champions. So there's a kind of clear stratification of class there. You know, your first and second, second class citizens with this mode. You also get a nice big stat screen at the end, which is always good. See how many pickups you got and all that sort of thing. That will help. It's like, all right, well, my accuracy sucks. This is a weapon I'm doing a lot of damage with. This is what this guy managed. Yeah. You can see he got way more mega health than I do. In fact, he had 11 mega health, whereas I never went into a fight with one. So that's a big deal, but I'm sure his teleporting lag switching nonsense probably helped too. Not a bad mode, but yeah, they're going to have to work with it. Anyway, as I was saying, dedicated servers. You're offering matchmaking. Great. You're using dedicated servers to do it. Also great. There's no server browser. Yet. There should be. <laughs> it's as simple as that, you know? If the game can support 16 players in some glorious cluster fuck, then do it. Let people do it. Let people create community servers. Let people come up with new game modes by changing modifiers and... Locking things and unlocking things. If you don't want a certain class in the game, ban it. If you don't want a certain weapon in the game, ban it. You want to do the whole thing as everyone has railguns? Do a rail arena? Make an instagib? Just let people do it that way. That's a great way to avoid having to have 5,000 different game modes in the matchmaking queue. Just put up a dedicated server and let people rent from in-game. If you're concerned about the longevity of the game when it comes to monetization, although you have both classes and loot boxes to do that with, and let's open one since we earned one, at least we earned something from fighting that cheating bastard. Well, here's the thing. You can rent servers to people. Now, you might be saying you should be able to buy servers externally outside the game. Yeah, but there's the concept of hills worth dying on and battles that have already been lost. And honestly, as much as I hate to admit it, I think the concept of buying servers on a third-party service or even setting up your own by running a dedicated server program, that is long since gone, honestly. Very few games offer it, very few indeed, and as long as there is an option to get a server of some sort, I'll take it. Do it better than Battlefield 1 did. Their service is not only overpriced, but also terrible when it comes to the level of customization you've got. But just run us some servers. Have a clan pay option where people in a clan can pay a dollar each towards it every month. Or hell, maybe even let them earn some currency in the game to pay for their server. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. And it's a great solution to most of those problems. The guys that want purity, they can have it. They can go to a server that offers that. And then you don't have to focus on that as a developer. You can focus on the modes that you think are the main modes that the majority of people are playing. And you can let the server owners determine the rest and let the chips fall where they may. Maybe the pure mode is inexplicably popular. I don't believe it will be, because again, I've seen time and time again, these games try that no. and nobody support them. And indeed, Quake Live offers plenty of pure mode and it barely has a thousand concurrent players on Steam. That sounds like a lot, but compared to most games, not really. The game is holding on. You can play it, certainly, but you also have to bear in mind there is a massive skill gap in that game. People have been playing it for 10 years versus newbies. Well, you're in trouble. So it's nice to have a clean slate, a do-over, with a game like Quake Champions. And in this case, they have modernized it in a couple of ways. They've said, look, people like playing classes. People like having abilities they can use. So let them do it. But let's try and make it Quake-like. I'm happy with that. I like the fact that these power-ups are tied to these cooldowns. These cooldown drops that you can pick up. These little hourglasses. In fact, I think probably... In many cases, the timer on these should probably be extended. Emphasize those pickups a little bit more. Put a few more in the map. Emphasize grabbing those resources to allow you to use that power. The more you do that, the more Quake-like it is, right? In this case, you also have those passives, and the different modes in which these characters can move is really interesting. There's an example. I did this, so this is my crouch slide that I can do with this character. Now I can do my standard strafe jumping. I'm not very good at that, but I can kind of get some speed up. But I can also do this slide, which is powerful and lets me really build up some momentum. So if this is the kind of thing that I can get used to and get good at, I can become a character that can move very quickly and I could maybe become a very good flag runner on here. 
But if I'm not the sort of person that's going to get good at movement mechanics, there's nothing stop me from just picking a simpler character in that regard. So just pick a character that when they jump, they accelerate. You don't have to strafe jump or anything. Or pick a character that just accelerates on its own. It exists. You can do it. That's, that's the great thing about it. It's that level of choice. Quake has that inherent skill flaw. You've got to get at least half decent at movement to be any good at Quake whatsoever. And some people may just never get there. It's the same issue that fighting games have, that someone will never... There are some people that cannot do a DPM FP, a Dragon Punch movement. They can't do it, and they never will be able to do it. So, the solution to that is maybe offer a character that doesn't. you don't have to do that with. Some people argue, well, it's lowering the skill ceiling. No, I think it's raising that skill floor. It's lowering the skill gap. The skill ceiling is still there. Great players with those characters like Visor and maybe even this one right here are going to move incredibly fast. They're going to be able to outmaneuver and outplay pretty much everybody else. They're going to have resource control that they otherwise would not have because of their speed. They're going to be able to evade shots that other people cannot evade because of their speed. They have not made this game easier. They have just given people more choices in the way that they actually play it. Now, the mode that I'm playing right here is that 4 versus 4 sacrifice mode. It's very similar to Capture the Flag. But there's a slight difference. Now, the soul is the flag. The soul spawns on the map. You have to take it to an obelisk. When you take it to that obelisk, that becomes your team's obelisk, and the other one becomes the opposing obelisk. Once you have it, it is your job to defend it as it charges up, as you can see. So we're almost there. When it reaches 100%, we score a point. Now, if I stand within range of the enemy obelisk that currently has the soul for a couple of seconds, then I get... Thank you. I get the soul. It takes a couple of seconds to grab it. You can't just run in there and get it immediately. You've got to stay within that zone for like a second or two. So it's like, you know, a slight bit of little like domination in there. Little spin. And then when I get it, I can just run off with it just like the flag, bring it to the other place and done. Simple as that. So a slight change, but it works. And of course the rounds have timers. I think when you hit three, that's the end of the round and you play a best of three, I think in terms of the rounds. I like this mode a lot. However, I think that the UI could definitely do with changes that indicate more clearly to new players as to actually what they have to do. Now, the announcer is worth listening to is to say, oh, attack the thing. Okay, well, the problem with attack the thing is that some people view it as, oh, okay, I've got to go to the, go to the enemy area. And then they're just going to hang around there, even if they've either already picked up the soul or there isn't even a soul there to pick up. There needs to be clear indications on the map as exactly what you got to do. Right now, it's pretty clear. Defend B. So that means go to B. But the clearer you can make this, the better it's going to be. I have had problems with public teams before who just simply don't seem to get it. They don't seem to understand the game mode. And as a result, they end up being useless teammates, unfortunately. I'll also say, of course, that since this is a team-based game mode, there are certain characters that are going to benefit more so than others, but you do have some nice role definition there. Even if every character can kind of do the same thing, there are certain characters that are going to be better at running the soul, certain characters that are going to better be better at simply defending. So you naturally fall into those roles and you get to choose them, but of course you still have the same weapons as everybody else, you can still do all the same things as everybody else, you just do it in a little bit of a different way, and you got a few different stats. Thank you for my mega health, that will keep me alive, I hope. And we'll set you on fire, there we go. There's certainly some ability balance that probably needs doing, but... I think this mode's good. But yeah, overcome those issues on the UI and make it 100% clear what's going on. You know what I think would benefit the game significantly? Get rid of the announcer, change it. It sounds monotone. It's so... He's so monotone, he's actually hard to hear. And the announcer is key to knowing what's going on. Make him more exciting make his announcement easier to hear. He's got this horribly deep monotone Krendor voice that I can't even listen to properly. Not the kind of person I want to be informed by. Of course, there's your another little monetization option. I have different announcer packs, of course. Why not? Alright, it's telling us to attack point A because they have the thing, apparently. We don't want them to have the thing. So we should probably better go there. It's a good solid mode, though. I'd be interested to see if this ends up being the eSports mode. Maybe. Could be. Not stopping it. You know, it's a team-based objective mode that's basically capture the flag, and it's not like other games have not used capture the flag as their main competitive mode before. 
I think so. I think it's you could do that. It will be interesting to see what they pick or indeed maybe what the community gravitates to. It might not be the decision of the devs. Might be down to what the... Uh, and we're leaving. No, I actually tossed it there. And then I'm going to use this. There we go. Toss that and ignite it. Yes, we are leaving. We are going bye-bye. As you can see, this character is quite good for running the flag. Assuming that you don't suck at the movement mechanics, which I do, but I'm getting there. There we go. Slide and slide and cash it in. There we go. Very nice. And now we've just got to defend it. Armor's up in a minute as well. Good to keep an eye on that. Can have it, can have it, can have it, can have it, can have it. Please, please, yes, there we go. You'll note that there are indicators for timers. For purists, oh, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. I don't care. <laughs> it's like what people will say, well, learning timers is important. Yeah, but if you're playing at a truly competitive level, you have learned the timers. You're not relying on those little clocks. It's just, again, a way of raising the skill floor. Not being exclusionary. Like, I don't put value in that skill. It's not an interesting skill. It's not a skill that anybody really notes when spectating the game. It's one of those hidden mechanical skills that just makes the game less accessible to people, and yet doesn't really have any tangible benefit when it comes to the game's depth. StarCraft does a few things like that too, in my opinion. And again, a lot of people will say that's heresy, but that's my opinion. I'm sticking bloody to it. Thank you very much. And honestly, like I say, Quake experience, the purest experience is already available. You can play it right now, and you've been able to play it for the last 10 bloody years. As it stands, they've got to solve that netcode issue. They've got to make sure the monetization is fair. Prices are fair. I think there needs to be an in-game method of permanent unlocks rather than just those rents. You know, renting is fine in and of itself for trials, but it shouldn't be the only mode available for free-to-play players, I think. And there's probably some balance issues. Like I said, the pros have con had concerns about things like the heavy machine gun, things about certain hitboxes on certain characters, and specifically said that at a high level, fast characters are always superior to slow ones. There's no reason to pick those. Although, at a lower level, you can see the tankier characters are definitely useful. I think at this point that this game is very promising. I think they're making a lot of the right moves. The game is still difficult. It's still challenging. You still do all the quake things. Strafe jumping is still important. Rocket jumping is still important. Vital even in sacrifice, especially on other maps. Rocket jump can get you halfway across the level with the... Skull... with the soul or whatever it is. Yes, the flag. Why would you not want that? Of course it's super important. Of course you can do that. He's tossed it over there. Go get it. I'll defend you. It's good mode. Adding a couple more in would be nice. Get servers in there. Let people customize those modes and customize their experience and then you silence those people that are saying we want the purity and yet inexplicably don't already play the game that offers that i mentioned that a couple of times but i think you've probably figured out i'm just irritated by that argument in general i think it's a piss poor argument no they don't want it and if they did they'd already be playing it Right now, this is pretty damn good. I enjoy it. I want to see what they do with the champions. A few more power-ups would probably be nice. I want to see what they do with the maps. We only have access, of course, to a small number of them. So who knows whether or not the other maps are going to be better. There's probably some weapon balancing required tweaks, fixes. If they nail all that down, though, I think Quake Champions is a very attractive prospect. I want to play it. Certainly more than I want to play Quake Live. If you gave me a choice between the two, I'd pick Quake Champions every time. It's just a lot more fun. It's fresh. There's a new meta game. Everything's not hugely stale. A complaint that competitive players had about Quake Live is that dueling just had a very stable and meta that just never really moved all that much and never really changed all that much. And that's never good for a competitive scene. That will cause it to die off. But this is a new meta, it's a new game with new ideas. And yet, it feels like Quake. Anyone that tells you that it doesn't, is lying to you. Or they're just playing one of the weirdest characters that doesn't move like a regular character. There's no way that Ranger doesn't feel like Quake. There's no way that Anarchy and... Visor, that dude, yes. Don't feel like Quake. You've got a couple of different movement options. You've got more movement options than you had, but that doesn't mean it doesn't feel like Quake. It, of course it does. It absolutely does. And it should be applauded for that. I'm really interested to see what this game does on launch. I don't know how long they're going to stay in beta. They were very cagey about answering that. I don't know when the release is going to come out, but 
I want to play it. I have a feeling this is going to be a game that I play a good amount of. And a game that keeps me hopefully coming back for more with... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What I would hope would be... A cool ranking system. The ability to rank up. Ah, well, that didn't work out well, did it? And, of course, a bunch of champions and cosmetics to unlock. Keeps it fresh. Keeps me guessing. New maps coming out all the time. New rotations. Maybe weekly game mode, like a kind of tavern brawl that you could queue for that has a wild set of mutators. Well, that's not Quake. Well, it's certainly bloody well on real tournament. And if you're going to ape anything, that's not a bad thing to ape. Quake champions currently in beta, ladies and gentlemen. Out for the next few days in open beta. Go try it out yourself. You can get a key from the Bethesda website. You can try it yourself and see what you think. I'm enamored by it right now. I think it's a very fun game. It just needs to be fixed in some fairly crucial areas. Because I'm never bloody playing duel again if I have any chance whatsoever of running into a bastard like that with his mysterious I'm about to die lag. That's legitimate, I'm sure. Quake Champions, here you go. Will be available at some point. Currently in open beta for you to try for free. Thank you very much for watching, folks. Eat it! I'll see you next time. Oh, yes.